All right, so we can question more power structures going forward. Let's get to uh, current events in like places like New York and San Antonio, which might be far apart and have cultures that are rarely compared, and yet they have a similar problem that is uh, that's plaguing them. So uh, we're going to go to that, and then we have the four hundred twenty-five million, which isn't a lot of money; it's just half a billion for Ukraine. And uh, we'll then compare that to hurricane relief runs out of money for some reason. Not sure where all the money's going. Also, just a thought real quick. If you are a self-reliant adult and you're out in the world and you're trying to pay your own way and you encounter debt and you pay, make your monthly payments or you have a mortgage, all that good stuff, right? If you have extra money and somebody's in need, sometimes you loan them money. If somebody's in money, uh, they need money, uh, and you don't have it, sometimes, sometimes you'll go into debt to help that person, but they're usually like someone you really care about, family member, close friend, colleague, someone who suffered a tragedy, and you're like, I know how to take care of myself. I'll take care of that debt. Let's help them out. However, if you notice, our country's policy with debt is like the opposite. We don't go into debt to help our own people. We only go to help like Ukraine and far off places, Lebanon, let's send some money over there last week because we also support Israel who bombed them, so we feel bad. Like all that stuff needs to stop. This is like a QVC middle of the night, your family member has a problem just spending money with other things that don't support the family. You need to have like some tough love and maybe an intervention and maybe stop that because when I see FEMA running out of money and comments like that, I think, well, we can't, why can't we just print more debt? We do that for all these other countries. They did $5 trillion during COVID to give away to their friends. We can't print some money for people in this country, veterans, people who are adversely afflicted by natural and uh, maybe aggravated disasters, right? Lahaina, these types of things, East Palestine, uh, North Carolina. So anyway, just keep those things in mind because it just seems like how you would run your household is not how they run the government. And the reasons for not running it like that aren't very good. It's just because they're gangsters and they're stealing your money. And uh, these wars in places are places to launder your money so they can give it to their friends. This is how it works. So we're going to get into it. Let's check out San Antonio uh, with uh, Tim Pool. And then we'll get to New York City with Cash Jordan. It's the latest in social rehabilitation efforts. The Daily Mail. Evil super gang seizes four apartment complexes in San Antonio. Well, that's only a handful, Tim. <laughs> it, it, it is true. I think it's a super gang. I, that's that's I like that. Sounds like something Trump would super say. Gang. I kind of like that. Super gang. It was They're a super, super gang. <laughs> Very big. Not good. It's like some disgrace. horrible crossover between the X Men and a gang. <laughs> it's uh, it is a it's a transnational gang. Wow. So. Remember when we were all like, oh, hey, geez, wow, they're taking over apartments in Aurora, and the media went, no, they're not. Now they've graduated to, but it's only a handful. How, now, we're, now we're up to, yes, but only a handful in a few cities. We are literally at the point where a foreign, invasive, violent faction has entered this country by force with guns and are occupying areas in New York City, San Antonio, Aurora, and, and I guarantee you, many other cities we don't yet know about. Yep. Yep. Texas. And guess what? Jeez. Anytime any of those stories get brought up, they're going to scoff at it, too. They're not going to say care. it's not true. <laughs> it's no big deal. And then, it's you know what? It's only a handful yeah, in and a few then cities. If and when that becomes the status quo because Kamala Harris gets elected, naturalizes all the illegals in every swing state that she's placed, and then Democrats win every election forever, uh, what's going to happen eventually is this will become commonplace, and they will say, there was never a time in American history where this didn't happen. This was always the norm. We just weren't talking about it. Whenever the left makes life worse for everyone or their policies completely fail and destroy our standard of living or decrease it, they go, well, that's always how it was. And, and, always, yeah. We've always had rolling blackouts, guys. Like, it's, 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 like, what, what do you mean? Oh, oh come on. Everyone I, used to have electricity. That Seamus, was propaganda. Fire and brimstone has always rained down from the heavens. <laughs> exactly. That's it's normal. always happened. <laughs> There's nothing we can do about it. None of our behaviors should change. Let's just keep living the way we are. We have kind of a preview looking at Europe. They're about 10 years further down the road than us. You know, you have all these kind of no-go zones for police where you have these enclaves of Islamic Sharia law. That where there's just no rule of law. There's no Western rule of law in those in those zones. It's um, an invasion. It's yeah, a absolutely. literal invasion. You have people... If you've gotten to the point where police officers are no longer able to enforce the country's decided upon laws within a particular region, that region belongs to somebody else, right? That That's insurrection. Mm -hmm. 
It's <laughs> it is. If you want to talk about insurrection, that is a, that that is sedition. It's worse than January six. Even letting worse. letting them come and do whatever they want. If you allow people to take over a neighborhood and then your country's laws no longer apply to that particular region, they've effectively seceded. They can do whatever they want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sedition. Mm-hmm. A seditious conspiracy, in fact. Yeah. Maybe they should get 20 years in prison. <laughs> no, no, that's never going to happen. They're not going to get in trouble. They should send them back, though. What Yo, you, guys- uh, you, you guys got to watch last night's episode with R- Rudyard Lynch. A lot of people are messaging saying it was one of the best episodes they've ever seen. And the members only was also one of the best members only we've ever done. No uh, pressure, Joel. <laughs> but I don't want to necessarily repeat things that were said because they were like up there. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I'll, keep, I'll leave it at that. But I recommend you watch last night's episode. It got really heated around like eight, uh, about a four, about 40 minutes in when Rudyard started getting into history of falling dynasties, civil war, revolutions. And let's just say that he gave specific examples of various collapses of societies throughout history to what we see today. And then he made a rather extreme prediction, which is the most extreme prediction I've heard anyone give. And uh, he's very convincing because he's like, I don't know, robotic almost. <laughs> he, he's not animated or holding up a sign saying the end is nigh. He's simply saying, like, well, what we saw with the French Revolution is the king trying to suspend parliament, parliament refusing, and then overnight you get civil war, you get violence, you get riots, and it was a series of revolutions. In fact, it wasn't just one. He said... And counter-revolutions. Right. It was, it was fighting back. And, and, and then you got an, um, the empire, and then he said that he is a bet with a friend that the United States will see 1,000 political deaths domestically by April. Wow. And I, I'm thinking, like, okay, I got optimism bias and normalcy bias. That's not going to happen. Well, you know, <laughs> Mr. Civil War? Yeah. You don't think it's going to happen? Yeah, because, and this is, this is another point of the conversation. Mr. Civil War is, I read an article in a, in a newspaper and then said, they said a civil war may, may be coming. Now, I don't know when or how that would happen, but I, I can't imagine a scenario that a thousand people that, I mean, yeah. we, we certainly postulated and came up with potentialities of how it could happen, but I'm like, I don't know about that by April. And, uh, yo, it, it, he's a smart guy and he, he laid out his arguments and they're very convincing political crisis. He said, we're at a point in this country where it is obvious. Both sides do not care to convince each other. They care to only convince each other that they have plausible deniability to engage in whatever ba- behavior they need to, in order to, con- to, to take power. He also said he thought Trump is going to win the election, but that Democrats are going to reject it. This is going to lead to a political crisis and then so on and so forth. Hmm. What was the, they, they had a, a couple of FBI whistleblowers on Capitol Hill a few weeks ago. Um, I, I can't remember who these guys were, or what they were whistleblowing about, got kind of the corruption that's going on in the FBI. Um, but at the end of the, the whistleblower's testimony, this, uh, this FBI agent said, it, uh, my advice to the American people right now is to buy guns and ammo. <laughs> and hunker down. <laughs> and hearing that from a, an FBI whistleblower, it has a little more weight than just some random guy. You know what I mean? Like, I, you're like, what, what does he mean? You know, uh, <laughs> what, what's coming? One, one of the most important things he said was that people have this thing in their mind where they believe it happens slowly. Hmm. But every single instance has been a overnight thing. And he mentioned the Bolsheviks were about 3% of the country in Russia. Yep. And they took power. You do not need, and, and, and I have been, I have been banging my head on the table telling people this, they don't get it. Like Bill Maher, like there's not going to be, this was, this was talk four years ago when Bill Maher was talking about civil war saying, no, it's not going to happen. And, uh, uh, people seem to think you need a Mason Dixon line. See, people seem to think that you need two opposing state factions that align themselves. None of this is true. People seem to think, no, but you need like large populations. Never the case. That the famous quote is, what is it like? Never let it be said that a small group of dedicated people can't change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. When you look at almost every revolution or civil war or conflict, it happens seemingly overnight. And it happens with a relatively small group of people. Granted, to be fair, the American Civil War did take a very, very long time. And, and people don't realize how weird and bizarre the level of peace and prosperity we've enjoyed for the last 60 years is. Yeah. Yep. It is an anomaly. Um, and it, it's just the last 20 years, it seems like a lot of groundwork has been set for, uh, for hard times to come again. Not to be yep. pessimistic or no, anything. no. But, it's totally <laughs> it's, right. but I don't think it's pessimism. I think it's just realism, right? Yeah, the, we we have lived in a golden age. Yeah, where we've we we have morbidly obese homeless people. Yeah, like this is incongruous with reality. It it cannot be sustained. 
morbidly obese homeless people, it seems to be non paradoxical in a sense. We've solved hunger. I, I, I was doing this research when I, I was looking into the, the free school lunch programs that Tim Walls is doing and, and some of these other uh, governors are doing. And I wanted, to, I wanted some figures on how many kids have died of starvation in the last 10, 20 years in the United States. The answer is zero. There have been no kids that have died from starvation, unless it was like a, an abusive... But they are dying of heart attacks and stuff. Right, yeah. Heart attacks, cancer, obesity, all that stuff. Uh, yeah, 100%. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I mean, I'll tell you what, uh, Bob, uh, I'll tell you what. (laughs) Well, no, I mean, we have in this particular country solved hunger. The issue is, you know, people to, I I hate to quote him, but as Jordan B. Peterson always says, they want to compare it to the hypothetical. You have to do it in his voice. It's like, man, people are trying to compare this country to the hypothetical (laughs) utopia in their mind and not reality. That's why it's all falling apart, man. But but they're chimpanzees full of snakes. When, when I was in college, I had a conversation with a woman. I remember this was in, I believe this was in 2015. And we were all out to dinner and there was a shooting in France. Some Islamic extremists. Is this the Bataclan? There are growing concerns among residents and business owners here. They say they're losing their community. Former city councilman Hiram Montserrat wants Governor Kathy Hochul to send in the National Guard. This is organized crime. So an entire New York City neighborhood has been taken over by gangs, and there's nothing the city's able to do about it. Because even after several police raids of this formerly vibrant middle-class neighborhood, the levels of criminal activity here continue to soar. And that's why residents are demanding the governor step in and send in the troops. I actually got to speak to a couple of community members. They say that organized crime has taken over this community. They demand the community be cleaned up immediately because walking down the street isn't safe anymore. You want to live in this country. You want to get the American dream and what you're doing is completely wrong. You're breaking the law. Now they're in broad daylight. They're in front of schools. We have garbage. We have illegal vendors. We say no more. They're going to shut you down. That's the promise from officers raiding this Roosevelt Avenue massage parlor. Two days after, they reopened. And we came here last night, they were here. The mayor said the flood of migrants coming to the city with little support systems contribute to the situation. And you know, police tell us that the migrant crisis has really made this problem so much worse. Not only is there increased gang activity, but also... The string Nanawa gang that originates in Venezuela has now made the United States their second home. This gang is now hidden in plain sight within the one million Venezuelans that have entered the country. We're already in trouble because they've been here for a while and they're involved in so many different crimes. You name the crime, they're going to be involved in it. For months, crime in a middle-class part of New York has been allowed to surge to levels beyond anyone's control. But even though things here have gotten really bad over the last two years, what nobody's talking about is that this never would have happened in the first place if we had laws that punished criminals, but we don't. And the growth of crime here is something critics say is headed to every neighborhood in town if things don't change. And if troops aren't sent in to get rid of these gangs. Because what we're witnessing in this part of town is the end game of every type of crime our leaders continue to defend as nonviolent and victimless, like shoplifting, which we've decriminalized in this state and made a non-jailable misdemeanor, which allows repeat criminals to earn thousands taking whatever they want from any store in town and reselling it, which you'll see happening on Roosevelt Avenue on practically every street corner, with some open-air theft markets set up right by the stores those goods come out of. But that's far from the only type of crime taking place in that part of town 24 hours a day. Here you'll find everything from illegal food vendors operating restaurant-grade kitchens right on the sidewalk, to businesses that look legitimate but sell things they shouldn't and are part of a criminal economy that just keeps growing and growing. Which brings us to the real reason why residents are now demanding that troops come in and get rid of the criminal element in their neighborhood once and for all. The police have been trying to do this for over a year, but it hasn't been enough. Because after they raid a store or a business or a bunch of sidewalk shops, those vendors come back and reopen within hours of the police walking away. And as you're about to see, this system of constant, unrelenting crime is leading to the destruction of a middle-class neighborhood, which should be a warning and a wake-up call to the rest of this city and the rest of this country. But this raises a big question. Why is this such a problem in only one area of New York and not anywhere else? And why do certain parts of town like this look perfectly fine when we've got others near here where the residents wish they were living under martial law?
So here we are in Midtown Manhattan, and you'll notice right over here we've got some police activity going on, but this part of town is completely different than another part of town, which is very close to here. And right away, there's an obvious reason for that. Look at all the police activity we've got going on right here. That shows you that in an area of town where you've got constant crime prevention, it's pretty hard for criminals to operate, you know, right over here on the street corner, selling stuff they shouldn't. But in Jackson Heights, Queens, you won't find constant law enforcement and crime prevention. No, instead you'll find constant criminal activity. Former city councilman Hiram Montserrat wants Governor Kathy Hochul to send in the National Guard or state police to help clean up the area. He says it's plagued by criminal activity, including illegal vendors, and that's not all. This is organized crime. This is cartels. These are organized gangs. They're street gangs. So the residents of this neighborhood, they're protesting over the fact that their neighborhood, according to them, is getting swallowed up by a wave of lawlessness that is not going away. And now they want their neighborhood to be occupied by the National Guard or state police or something that is more than our regular police. And that's because they're claiming their local police departments are chronically understaffed and have been defunded. In fact, when you walk around this part of town, the only police presence you'll see, if you see any at all, is going to be a light fixture that has the NYPD logo on the side of it. And this is an area that is just jam-packed with people. This is like downtown, so to speak, yet you don't have anything being done to keep the neighborhood safe. And the streets in this part of town, both sides of the street, are just covered with illegal vendors selling pretty much everything. You're going to see blankets with merchandise being displayed on top of it, merchandise which is most likely stolen. There are hundreds of food vendors all over the place. Local activists claim that most of them are unlicensed and shouldn't be there. Some even have what look like restaurant-grade kitchens with fryers. And the other thing you'll see are these vans that have their doors open, and inside you'll see what looks like a little store full of things you can buy. And if the police show up, they can just close the doors of their van and drive away, and their stolen merchandise won't get confiscated. And even though all of this is happening in public, there are no police anywhere, and that's because the police department's up there. They don't have the resources that we've got down here in Midtown, where you'll see a car with its lights on to convey a visible authority presence to the general public. In Queens, there is no authority presence, and that's why you have a massive criminal presence. It's the perfect place for gangs to just roll in and do whatever they want because no one's there to stop them, which hurts everyone. Local New Yorkers, law-abiding asylum seekers, nobody benefits from this except the criminal underworld. Yet the lawless environment happening in Queens mirrors another lawless environment that the National Guard was recently called in to deal with, and that would be our subway system, which was an absolute disaster, experiencing six felonies a day until 1,000 extra police and National Guard Guard troops set up checkpoints and started cracking down. And now in Queens, we've got residents demanding the exact same type of response. You, you walk by the, by the girls and they give it, they offer him business cards. The rally was held just steps away from an illegal brothel on K Street, raided last month by the NYPD. Two days after, they reopened. And we came here last night, they were here. So, in this part of town, when things go wrong, there's an immediate response from emergency medical personnel, from law enforcement. Nobody gets away with anything down here like they do in Queens. And that's because when there's a problem down here that requires a police response, they stick around to make sure that the work they did wasn't in vain. In this part of town, if the police shut down your business, they're going to be around tomorrow to make sure you don't try and reopen. But apparently in this part of Queens, once a business gets shut down, it reopens. They don't care. And the vendors on the sidewalks, well, they just wrap everything up and run away. If they're in a van, they close the doors of that van, drive away, and drive back. Nothing stops them. And in many cases, they're just blatantly selling things right in front of some of the stores where those items were stolen. It's absolutely ridiculous, to be honest with you. I can't believe it's actually a real thing, but it is. And the other problem making this so much worse is that even if people are put in the back of a police car, our soft-on-crime laws typically release them, which means they can go right back to doing what they were doing when they got arrested. And according to local residents, there are so many illegal businesses, when one gets shut down, the others are still operating. They don't see any reason to close. And that just tempts the people that did get arrested to come back because they see their competitors are still open. But before we get into the gang related aspects of this, it's important to understand that for many years, criminals of all backgrounds and nationalities have been making this part of New York City a nightmare for locals. It's just gotten a lot worse in the last couple of years. And we know this is the case because over the last year, police have been raiding and shutting down these illegal businesses. They've done it multiple times. 
the news cameras have been there to capture the whole thing, and it still looks just as bad today, maybe even worse than it did before raids that happened as early as just a couple of weeks ago. And you know, police tell us that the migrant crisis has really made this problem so much worse here along busy Roosevelt Avenue. Not only is there increased gang activity, but also women, migrant women from other countries, desperate to find a job. We say no more. So there are a couple of reasons why things here are just spiraling out of control. First, New York City, we've got an asylum crisis that's seen over 200,000 people come to New York, and many have been moved into city-run shelters by humanitarian care workers who have allowed people to believe that they were just steps away from achieving the American dream. They were going to live in a shelter for a couple of weeks and then be back up on their feet, no problem. But that hasn't been reality for many people. They can't get jobs. There aren't enough opportunities for many of the folks that are there. And now they're getting kicked out of these shelters. They're living in tents in many cases outside of the very facilities that they've been kicked out of. It's very sad. People are disillusioned. They've got nowhere else to go. But that problem is magnified by the fact that dangerous gangs are now coming here because we're a sanctuary city and taking advantage of these people. And not only do sanctuary policies allow members of gangs like Trend de Aragua to hang out in New York City while avoiding federal immigration enforcement, their presence here just makes things worse for the thousands of asylum seekers who are still here and are struggling and in some cases are being coerced to join up with these gang members. Hey, come see us on two. We're going to be in Los Angeles, Columbus, Ohio, Dayton, Cleveland, Cincinnati, Lexington, Kentucky, Burbank, California, and Honolulu. Go to JimmyDoor.com for a link for tickets. Hey, they're sending more money to Ukraine in case you were worried that Ukraine didn't have enough money. While oh, the, how much? They while just the, need a little more. Well, the people who are wiped out by two different hurricanes in the United States are begging for $700 that they won't give them. Yeah. Biden administration announces additional security assistance for Ukraine. Yeah. The Biden administration, I expect, I suspect that there's some elder abuse happening here. <laughs> it seems like it. Remember the Astor widow and her son got uh, prosecuted for like uh, taking advantage of her in her old age. So, yeah, yes. So, uh, the, how much he says the president, presidential drawdown authority package in which an estimated value of 425 million will be provided to ukraine 425 million so i mean at well, least it's it's only in the millions it's not in the billions like it used to be so i think we're kind of it's like it's like instead of going cold turkey you're kind of taper off drinking it's like yeah ah, just one more shot <laughs> yeah just a little bit just a little I mean, bit. it's not it's, enough to do anything right right just a shot to take the edge off it's not i'm not getting drunk it's Remember just in a, Chicago? Just a half a billion dollars. It's not that much. That's what you would uh, charge Trump for, for a non-crime that's being overturned. That's right. That's right. Here's our Secretary of State, Antony Blinken. He says, today I am announcing the delivery of $425 million of support for Ukraine's defense. The United States and more than 50 nations stand united with Ukraine. And this support will ensure continued robust support in the months ahead. And he also added, uh, the president totally said that it was uh, his idea, and uh, it's not like we put a, it's not like we put a pen in his dead hand and moved it around to make him sign it. That would be crazy. That would be absolutely crazy. Uh, Ian Carroll says, remind us again how much has gone to hurricane survivors in your own country, F and traitor. Well, they spent a lot of money generating the hurricane, so you got to give them that. Very expensive weaponry. I know there's a lot of uh, these high up political figures who are supposed to be swingers, but I know there's a lot of Americans who wouldn't mind see them swinging, if you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> they certainly talk like they're afraid of that, don't they? And for my idiot friends from Hollywood, like my ex friend Vance, who revealed his complete <laughs> hypnosis he's under by the mainstream news media yesterday on Twitter to me. Go to my Twitter feed. You won't believe it. You won't believe it. That's a grown man with kids who believes every... There isn't a thing he doesn't believe that comes out of MSNBC or CNN. So just, just, to, just to remind them, just to remind people like that, people with no, absolutely no brain power at whatsoever and a, not an original thought in their life, I'm going to, I'm going to, this is a very quick, is a two minute synopsis of how we got to where we are in the Ukraine war. It's not because Putin's evil and he woke up one day 
and decided to invade Ukraine. Jeffrey Sachs is going to tell you exactly Wait, what is, happened. Does Bro, Vance work yeah, the road? Does Vance work? No, Vance never. He was never able to become. There a you go. That's called being provincial, never traveling and yeah, being a bumpkin. Yeah, that's right. He, Anybody on the road could see what's happening. But all right. the guys, you know, that aren't on the road. That's right. That's why they don't know anything. No, he was never able to become a, a working comedian. But um, here we go. Well, yeah, the war began 10 years ago when the Victoria Nuland not only passed out cookies uh, on Maidan, but uh, engaged in, in insurrection to violently overthrow a government in Ukraine. Pretty stupid. Pretty that means the CIA overthrew the democratically elected government in Ukraine in 2014. That was a decade ago. That's how this war started. And now he's and he's telling you how stupid that is. Why is that stupid? Stupid to uh, have a regime change operation uh, on uh, a country with a 2000 uh, kilometer border with Russia. That's our American foreign policy. That's when this war started. This war didn't start in February 2022. It started in February 2014. It started with Newland. It started with Blinken. It started with Sullivan. It started with Biden who was a key person in that whole thing. And then the fighting went on for 10 years. And then in December 2021, Putin said, look, stop the NATO enlargement. We can avoid an escalation. I talked to the White House at that point. Yeah, we don't stop anything. They just thought they had all the cards. We're going to cut them out of the swift banking system. We're going to bring the economy to the knees. Bunch of nonsense by ignorant people. And so Putin escalated. He didn't start the war. He escalated the war. And within a, basically a week, Zelensky said, OK, 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 we can be neutral. And the Turks mediated negotiations. And then, though the U.S. government wants to hide all of these facts, which are sitting out there for those who know where to find them, the U.S. intervened and told the Ukrainians, you keep fighting. And we have we have our senators who say this is the best the best uh, money that money can buy because it's Ukrainians dying, not Americans. They're weakening Russia. Well, they're not weakening Russia, but they are killing Ukrainians. So this is not responding to Putin's invasion. The war started 10 years ago and we kept refusing every off ramp till this day. Robbie, you know, you hear Putin say, and if you listen every day, we're open to negotiations. And then these fools in the U.S. government say there's no one to negotiate. They don't want to negotiate. And then President Putin says, oh, we we, we we're open to negotiation. Oh, there's no one to negotiate is what we hear from the U.S. side. This is just narrative. So, you know why uh, negotiating doesn't make anybody more money? Yeah, that's the only disagreement I have with him is, no, they're not fools. You're the fool if you believe that they think that. They know what they're doing. That's what they think. That stupidity that they say is what they think of you. Because they got their own agenda, which is why they keep it up. There's no way this loser of a war, just like all the other wars, the only reason they keep going is because someone way above your pay grade wants it that way for reasons that don't help you or Ukraine. That, that is correct. Um, just like, I mean, I mean, people really, after the Iraq war, after 20 years of lies about Afghanistan, after Syria, after Libya, you still believe these people when they tell you about Ukraine, why, what it's all about? Yes, they do. We have it here from the post-millennial Biden Harris admins disaster loan program tapped out after hurricanes, but wait, the next story Biden announces $425 million in military aid for Ukraine. How could and now, be true? And now, you may not be very angry at this, so I'm going to play this video for you. My mom lives across the street. She's 92 years old. And I, as I was trying to get her to the door, my husband looked out and he says, we can't get out. We went to the back door and my husband got a foothold because the water was probably knee deep. And he pushed me across the water to where I could get a foothold. 
and then he lit, got my mom and put her out to where I could get a hold of her hands and I pulled her to me. And then I saw my house. It was just like it picked up. The water was over the top. You could just see the eve. <laughs> just like it floated away. And as it went across, I think the tip end of my house hit my mom's house. And hers just uprooted and it floated away. So that's, we just lost both of them. But we are alive, which I'm so blessed and so grateful. But we've lived here 50 years and my mom had lived there 70 years and we've just never seen anything like this. So shout out to the Appalachian podcast. And uh, thank you for watching that short clip of this uh, woman who is suffering. It's brutal to watch. And I hope, uh, I hope y'all are watching this are not sad. I hope you're infuriated mm -hmm. because the context is the loan program for disaster is tapped out, but $425 million of American taxpayer money is flowing right over to Ukraine. So I don't care what the reason is. I don't care for the fact checkers to come out and say, but Tim, those are different funds. And Congress has a, I don't care. Congress should get their asses back to Washington, D.C. and make sure that little old lady can take care of her mom and they have houses before they give one penny to Ukraine. You, you have to stop giving the benefit of the doubt to political actors who think that you're evil and that your way of life should be destroyed, right? We have to look at this and we have to say, you know what? because we don't trust these people. There's only one answer to this. The purpose of a system is what it does. The purpose of this system that our leaders have developed is to send money to foreign countries <laughs> and allow Americans to die. It's not wait, even wait, wait, America, uh, uh, America last. It's quite yeah. literally America never, never, right? America never. And, yeah. and it's not even just the 425 million that they announced today. Cause this is all coming from what was it about a month ago when they were negotiating the CR, they were coming up against the deadline that the white house is going to have to appropriate the 8 billion in aid for Ukraine. And it's so wild, right? When they had an outstanding $8 billion worth of funds for Ukraine, instead of reappropriating it for the United States, they chose to a continue to administer it to Ukraine, but it was October 2nd as people like her were having her houses ripped away that they actually gave several hundred million dollars for, uh, via USAID to Ukraine for, I kid you not, storm preparation yeah. and winter <laughs> weatherization efforts. Yeah. And you remember, but it's so tone deaf. You have Kamala Harris tweeting, oh, I'm giving $157 million to Lebanon. And I think, too, you know, as much as we could rank on how obvious it is that all they care about is Ukraine or Israel, any other country, it's very interesting, right, for all the what they claim to be bipartisan or independent NGO type activist groups that were busy giving upwards of a billion dollars, right, to election administration in 2020. Now you see the continued reporting NBC out today saying that, oh, there's difficulties with voting, especially in rural counties in North Carolina. You have David Axelrod celebrating that rural people probably won't mm -hmm. be able to vote. And it's so right? upsetting and it's, to watch it's that. It's wild. And frankly, I think it's proof that all of that private election spending in 2020 was set to turn out votes for Democrats, because where have they been after the hurricane, right? They haven't offered to give a single penny. I believe the number that I saw at the latest was $30,000 from Kamala. Harris and Joe Biden in its entirety to help voter efforts um, in North Carolina. And then, of course, you have far left lawyer Mark Elias celebrating the the uh, ballot changes that they've instituted there. But the hypocrisy right, there is just it's so glaring. Uh, Congressman. <clears throat> Somehow, I think people in North Carolina are going to find a way to vote, regardless of whether Biden gives them money or helps them find a way to vote. What do you think, Scott? Do you think they'll be resourceful like never before? I mean, I sure hope so. You know, I know that that's uh, probably one of the the key parts of this agenda is to to disrupt elections in those certain types of areas. I've already heard of, you know, elections getting disrupted in other areas like people in Georgia. I don't know if you saw that story. Like, I think uh, uh, Infowars kind of broke that one about how, like, already they go in and they, they press the button for Trump and then they print out the ballot and it says Biden right on it. You know what I mean? So there's stuff like that. So so the the, the interference is already happening. And like this is. You know, it's probably a stretch to assume that they caused the, the hurricane to disrupt North Carolina elections. But 
But then, you know, never let a good crisis go to waste, you know, never let, um, you know, a situation where people are already in turmoil. But I really do hope that, you know, if people feel in their hearts that um, voting is is their way out of the situation, that they do make the effort to go vote harder to their to vote to vote as hard as they possibly can in this situation. Yeah. All right. So <clears throat> there's two things I want to discuss. First off, um, I have this over here on Clip Genie. I did this nasty little search called Victoria Newland. Okay. Because you just heard Jeffrey Sachs refer to, hey, 2014, uh, they planned a coup. They started this whole thing. They started encroaching on Putin so that they could say Putin's the aggressor. <clears throat> I've seen this playbook before. So if we were to go back in the history of times we talked about Vicky Newland, I think it's this episode, which is probably, although the last, let's, let's go back. This one actually has her picture on it. That's what she looks like. Uh, she's married to Robert Kagan, a famous neocon who wrote a book called of paradise and power America and the new world order. Now this 2014 coup is part of this clip, which starts in 1993 with this document called Soros toward a new world order. So you got this theme of new world order. And you got Soros working with Jeffrey Pyatt, who's a U.S. ambassador in Victoria Newland, and they're planning this Maidan coup. So you could go to Clip Genie. So if you went to gtw.clipgenie.com, you search Victoria Newland. You go down to episode 69, and you start seeing these juicy clips where we unfolded. Here's what's going on. It starts in 1993. It continues in 2003 and 2004. It goes up to the 2013, 2014. And now we're in the 2023, 2024 unfolding of that war. So it's something that's been planned like 30 years ago. Soros is like NATO. This is how we need to play it. And now this is how Soros and NATO are playing it. And it's continuing to be a thing that we Americans are continually going in debt for. Because it's not like we have the money that we're sending them. That's all debt money printed in your kids and grandkids' names. So there's, you know, it's not something we should just say is conspiracy theory. Which is the predominant response retort if you bring up soros but i could show you soros transcripts with cfr farid zakaria over at cnn and <clears throat> like you know these are real things that go on in life there are also transcripts from the phone calls between soros and pyatt and newland and those characters who did the 2014 coup there's also a 2016 film by oliver stone called ukraine on fire about the 2014 might on coup that you might want to check out before you go like getting all you know black t-shirted up and being a Zelensky boy boy fan <laughs> again uh if if we wanted to pull up the clips of Zelensky's in heels clip genie could also do that for us but we're not going to do that because you would see how many times we actually have had to talk about that on the show. Cause it's a good thing to remind people, don't take these people too seriously. You know, Zelensky is not who the media presents him to be. And there's a reason that, you know, the, the short actor club, you know, uh, uh, Sean Penn, Ben Stiller, all those guys, like they, they hang out together cause they're theater groupies, all those guys. Yeah, man. They're actors, they're actors. 100 percent. yeah that is like they're the, like the I, men from kamala ad last week it's those guys yep yeah the, the, the Zelensky thing is like the psyop of all psyops right you know you make a tv show where he becomes president comedian becomes president then he does it in real life like this is like the psyop the ultimate psyop you guys wasn't like, that a robin williams movie where he was a comedian who became president okay yeah i think it was too i think what was that yeah there's they're not movie. even original with their scripting yeah. in these political things it's like wag the dog yeah. meets that ronald robin williams movie Totally. And you know, what's interesting about all this, like all that, that whole block of clips, you know, you can kind of tie it all together. And you, you'd mentioned the, the confessions of an economic hitman, John Perkins, mm -hmm. that was one of my early red pill books, you know, and, yeah. uh, fascinating stuff. And, you know, that's what we're seeing in Ukraine, you know? And so these guys like to play the long game. They really like to play the long game wherein they, they create strife and conflict in other countries. And then like, oh, we'll, we'll give you the loan to rebuild. Right. And there's already at just looking at like JP Morgan and, and BlackRock are, are bidding or, or investing in companies that are investing in the rebuilding of Ukraine. And so that's going to be a massive money grab right there. And, you know, that's one of the arguments or one of the speculations about why there's all of this, uh, you know, lack of crime enforcement in these large cities where, you know, in Portland, for example, like where I'm from, like I saw it firsthand, 
the downtown area just gets ravaged. You know, there's buildings that are closing up, going out of business between the lockdowns and the homelessness. You know, you go downtown and there's like, at least when I was there, like a lot of buildings were shuttered, you know, they're, they're moving out and going out of business. And so speaking of the long game, you know, what a great way to, to increase your investments is just by plunging the property values of these communities where, you know, you just let crime run rampant for a decade and all these businesses leave and then all the banks can come swoop them up. And then over a period of time, you can just, you know, regentrify the area. I'm sure there'll be a time where they just lock down and do like work camps for the homeless or something, right? Or something. And it's like, uh, all of a sudden, you know, you have uh, this area where you can just rebuild, right? And so it's it's the same scenario where you just ravage a community, ravage a country, and then scoop up all of that real estate or invest in and rebuilding. And then you just profit on, on the front end, you know what I mean? And so it's just like, it just seems to be, that's just a, a playbook that's being executed. And we know it that happened during that the did. American civil war. Pennies on a dollar, all sorts of development spurred after all that destruction. Because yeah. the, that's the whole thing. They destroyed a bunch of stuff they knew they would have to rebuild. And the bankers yeah. knew both sides would have to do that. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, like the enemy wasn't vanquished. Exactly. Exactly. They're, they're, Just like they're beating pulling Hitler the in World War II didn't vanquish the people who funded and put Hitler in power in the first place. Yep. And those people continue to be a thing multi-generationally. Twice a year, I teach a course called Autonomy. It's a 12 week course. It teaches leadership, entrepreneur skills, executive skills, all these types of things that I saw were taken out of our education system in order to make the schooling or indoctrination system that we've all probably went through. And it has served us well enough to be interchangeable cogs in the machine of the globalists. But if we want a homestead, if we want uh, a write our own ticket, work from home job, work from anywhere type of situation, they're not exactly handing those out at the end of college. They give you a piece of paper and they're like, good luck. So reality is dropping us off here, but the demands of reality are up here. So I created autonomy to help people close that gap for themselves so they can level up their skills to the demands of the situations that life is putting in front of us presently. Life's demands of intellect and understanding precision and complexity are ever increasing. The schooling didn't prepare us for it. The media is not going to do anything but reinforce what schooling prepared us for. And so we're going to have to take a leadership position and take steps off the beaten path to kind of blaze our own trail in life. What makes the Grand Theft World podcast unique, invigorating, exciting, and informative? Most other podcasts out there are either doing straight up interviews or they're just covering the daily news. They're covering current events from the day they happen. And that is effective, it's useful, it's a great starting point. And then sometimes these current events change during the week past the first story. So we like to give it a little time. You have to wait till some of the dust settles on these stories in order to give them accurate coverage. And the other thing that's really missing in the media landscape is covering the articles that are coming out every day. That's great. That's necessary. But who's bringing in contextual history so that you can understand what has been going on for decades and decades to lead up to the machinations and actions that we see unfolding today. So what we do here on the podcast is we cover current events. Many of these things are censored, but we wait about a week. As a forensic historian, I focused mainly through my career on the history of globalism and collectivism and things that they call maybe the new world order. There's a lot of facts to these sort of circumstances, groups, events, activities, working groups that they've had over time. So for Grand Theft World listeners, we not only break down the current events, most of which that are censored during the week, we provide you with contextual history, we give you the source notes, the references, we do deep dives, and this really empowers you with an understanding of context and history so that you can make more informed decisions in your life. There's also a community, a membership where you guys can actually ask questions and we can get into the show and share evidence. And there's a town hall weekly for Grand Theft World for those who listen to it and are interested in covering the stories that we don't get to during a six hour show. Listening to it an hour a day, you could uh, easily consume the week's news, but you're gonna have substance and meaning and context and understanding. And with that, you can make higher quality decisions in your life. So if you're interested in more quality in your life, go to grandtheftworld.com, click podcast at the top, and we'll see you there. Thank you. These allegations are false. This isn't Grand Theft Auto, folks. This isn't a video game.
What are the most surprising things that you discovered once you started pulling on that thread, who he was connected to, what institutions he was influential over, what events he participated in? You don't have to think about it, dude. I got this quote because uh, you said you didn't know much about Klaus Schwab. I made it my job to, as soon as this happened, I'm like, okay, this guy's their front man. Let me learn about the official history of the World Economic Forum. I got their 40-year history. I got every book that Klaus Schwab has written or ghost written. I went through those books. This is one of the most interesting passages. Come on, man. Come on. 